for everybody, my name is Fem yes. Uh, for everybody, my name is Femi Awodele, and um, it's a pleasure to be sharing today. I will be teaching. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak or write or anything, you know, I'm blessed with being a teacher. Uh, so I might not excite you uh, as a preacher will. Uh, what I will ask is that we will have question and answer time after. So if you have questions as we go along, write it in the chat or share with K. Ade uh, personally if you don't want to be recognized. So uh, we will start and I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can, uh, I'm going to expand this so that everybody can see it. Um, the schemes of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy, um, that phrase, the scheme of the enemy is found in 2 Corinthians 2.11, 2 Corinthians 2.11. And uh, I am, as a teacher, I encourage people not to take verses out of context. So I'm going to give you the context of this verse where Paul used the word schemes of the enemy. So the Corinthian church is a church that um, was started by Paul. It's one of the churches he started. And um, after he left, they... Uh, you know, they weren't doing well and somebody wrote Paul and Paul wrote them an initial letter. So depending on who you read, they will tell you two letters. Some will tell you four letters, but it doesn't matter for our teaching today. Uh, but the first letter was a very, very tough letter because the church was having problem with two big things, immorality and idolatry. Idolatry means serving other gods. So Paul wrote them a very tough, stinky letter. That is what we call First Corinthians chapter uh, First Corinthians. And then the second letter was a letter much more of encouragement to. He was happy that they received, however tough the first letter was, and he he kept encouraging them. And in chapter two of what we call Second Corinthians, he was talking to them about forgiving, forgiving. So basically, he was talking to them that unforgiveness is one of the schemes of the devil. It's one of the schemes. So he basically said, look, forgive because you don't, you don't want to be trapped in the schemes. Some translation will use the word wiles. It's the same thing or, or trickery of the devil. So that is where that 2 Corinthians 2.11 comes from. And if you have a question, like I said, please write it. So... The second part of it is that um, now it is important for us to know it is important for us to know who our enemy is uh, because Paul used the word enemy. Uh, Paul used the word enemy and also uh, Jesus used the word enemy. Uh, and in both cases, when Paul used the word enemy, and Jesus used the word enemy. They are both referring to the same thing. So now we should know who the enemy is. Now, number one, um, the enemy, when we identify the enemy in this context, uh, is not human. The enemy is Satan or devil or whatever name we call him. Uh, 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 so it is, can, can everybody please uh, mute if you don't mind? Okay, so... The, the devil or the enemy in this case is known by many names. Um, Satan means the adversary, devil, and whatever name. Uh, from scripture, we understand that what we, the enemy of God used to be an angel, uh, and he was kicked out of heaven with one third of the angels. They were kicked out of the third heaven. I will explain that to you later. They were kicked out of the third heaven. And uh, now some of them are kept uh, without interaction. Some of them uh, interact or function in the first heaven and the second heaven. Uh, but only the enemy, the Satan, goes to the third heaven. Again, like I said, I will explain that later, but I need to explain uh, who, this, who the enemy is. The enemy is also 100% spirit. 
is 100% spirit. And basically what that means is that uh, he has no body, he has no flesh. So when you see a cartoon of him in a red suit or a, a blue suit, that is just a cartoon. It's a caricature. Uh, the enemy, Satan, and the demons are 100% spirit. And um, uh, Satan, devil, is their leader. And um, the other angels falling are called demons. We see that in, in the scripture that I shared. Number two, the enemy uh, that we have identified as the fallen angel, Satan, and then his cohorts, uh, angels now called demons, they are also being used by God. I want you to know that, okay? They are being, God uses them uh, even today. He uses them. Uh, they, are cre they were created by God and God still today uses them. Uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, um, some of you probably are familiar with the story of the witch of Endor, uh, the, the witch of Endor, and, um, and a witch who is part of the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness uh, uses, um, uh, was able to speak truth because God used it. And if Satan knew that Jesus ultimately, ultimate goal was the cross, he will have made sure that uh, Jesus will not go to the cross. So I just wanted to make sure that you know that God still uses Satan. That's number two thing about the enemy. Number three thing about the enemy that I want you to know is that once human being fell, once Adam and Eve fell in the garden, Satan usurped. The word usurped is very important. The word usurp means to take something that does not belong to you. So let's say you are the secretary of an organization and you usurped the position of the chairman. That is what, so usurping means to take something that does not belong to you. So after God gave human being dominion and after the fall of human being in the garden, Satan basically usurped, took the authority of human being and created what is called a spiritual kingdom, what Jesus referred to as the kingdom of darkness. It is not a geographical kingdom. Okay, I want everybody to understand this because there are denominations, there are people that teach that the kingdom of Satan is a, ge is a place. No, 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 no. Satan is spirit. He doesn't live in one place, even though people joke around that he lives in bad places. Not really, but uh, I, I joke I joke about that too. But the kingdom he runs is a king is a spiritual kingdom. The Bible calls it Paul in Colossians one three. Uh, Paul calls it the kingdom of darkness. Even Jesus, Jesus said the kingdom of darkness, Amen. and in John eight, Jesus said you belong that to the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that their language is lies. And Jesus himself calls Satan the prince, the prince of darkness. So I want everybody to know okay. it is not a geographical kingdom. It is not uh, something you hold on to. Everything in this world created belong to God. The earth and its footstool belong to God. The okay. kingdom Satan created is a spiritual kingdom so i hope everybody understands that uh that that is why paul said those of us who are believers we're now in a new kingdom but i will explain that as we go along so on this page we identify who satan is 100 percent spirit uh he fell from heaven with one third of the angels we don't know the number we just know one third of the heaven he has many names he's known by his names are really attributes that is not his name the only time we know his name was when he was an angel and his name was Lucifer, son of the morning. But after that, we know him as, uh, based on his attribute, either adversary or accuser of brethren, which is what the devil is. Okay, so I hope you understand that. If you have questions, uh, please feel to write that out. So how does the devil work? So number one, uh, the enemy recognizes that he is 100% spirit. Okay, I want you to know that. Um, and he also recognizes the nature of human being. He recognizes the nature 
of human being because we are his target. Uh, uh, what are the things that he wants, really? The enemy has been judged, before I even go into this, the enemy has been judged. God has already judged him. Uh, those of you who are familiar with eschatology, you know uh, that there is going to be the end of the church age and there's going to be seven years of tribulation and then there's going to be a millennium and then there's going to be the battle of Armageddon and there's going to be final. The final judgment of Satan is that hell will be created. I'm going to say something that some of you are going to be shocked about. Hell is not in place right now. What we have is called Hades. There's Hades, and, and then at the end, hell will come into place, and demons and every human being uh, that follows Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Right now, there's Hades. So, uh, uh, again, if you ask me a question on Hades, I will explain that later. Uh, so, human being. Satan understands the nature of human being. So, what is the nature of human being? First Thessalonians 5.23, Paul said, and it's in many places in scripture, but I've chosen 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Paul said, human being that we are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. Let me repeat that. We are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. So our spirit, when we become born again, Romans 8.16, God's spirit bear witness with our spirit. Our spirit. Before God's spirit bear witness with our spirit, we are considered spiritually dead. We are considered spiritually dead. Okay? I hope everybody understands that. Spiritually dead does not mean your spirit is not linking with other spirits. It means it is not connected to God's spirit. So that is, this, that is human spirit. It comes alive when we connect to the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 16. Uh, or John 20. Jesus said, I breathe life into them. And in Acts chapter 2, we see the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So that is the Holy Spirit. Our body is our physical body. This physical body, we're going to shed it. We're going to get a new body uh, uh, eventually. Uh, this body needs water. Our new body will not need water. Uh, so this body has what is called the biological systems, uh, endocrine system, reproductive system, neurological systems, and all of those things. And eventually, we're going to shed it. Uh, uh, the body also has some physical things, attributes, the brain, and all of that. Our soul, which is what I'm going to focus on today, is, is the third part of our nature. But the soul is also broken down into three. I don't know why I didn't put a, a graph into this, so forgive me for that. Our soul has... Our, our soul has mind, will, and emotion. Mind, will, and emotion. So our mind, which is literally in the brain, is where we make decision, where we make decision. Our, our will is where we decide to do or not do the decision that we have made. It's very important that somebody understands this. Our mind is where decision is made. Should I love my husband? Should I do what God said I should do? Our will is what makes us to do or not do that which we know to do. Romans 7, 15, Paul said, uh, Paul said, the things I want to do or the things I know to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Who is going to help me? Luke 11, 42, Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass over me, but not my will, but your will be done. So will is where you do or not do what you know to do. So, and then our emotion is where is our body releasing hormone to reflect what we are feeling, Phys external attributes or internal attributes. Your body releases hormone to reflect circumstances around you, and that's our, our, our hormone. Now, as human beings, we, in the Garden of Eden, we died, uh, 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 we, we became sinful, and we have what is called sin nature. Okay? Sin nature. And Satan knows this, by the way. 
Sin nature is different from sin. I need to explain that to you. Sin nature is different from sin. Sin nature is what you inherit because you are born as a because you are born of a man and a woman. The ability or the desire to do what you want is what is called sin nature. The desire to do what you want is sin nature. When you do that thing, then it, it has become sin. I hope somebody understands this. If I think of slapping somebody, that is my sin nature. If I slap that person, then it becomes sin. Okay? Then, in Romans chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, Paul tells us that because of the cross, those of us who have become born again, we are now dead to sin. We now have power over sin. Not sin nature. So my sin nature can still send me to slap, but now with Jesus Christ, I have the power to say no. I hope somebody understands that. That is why Jesus, uh, Paul said, you are no longer slaves of your sin nature. You are now slave of righteousness. You are dead to sin because of what Paul called imputed righteousness. The righteousness that Jesus deposited on your behalf different from pursued righteousness or the one you walk out. So I hope you are following me. So Satan understands this and what Satan, the enemy and his demon does is they play a mindset game. They play a mindset game. So they come to your mind, basically your soul, and they, they want to make sure that you do not know what God says that you do not do what God says. Basically, it's a mind game. They lie, they deceive you, they use your sin nature, they use your emotion, they use everything they can use, but it is all a mind game. It is wrong ideology, it is wrong teaching, it is wrong everything. But basically, everything is a mind game. I have shared a couple of scriptures with you there. I will share this PowerPoint. Um, with uh, 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 Pastor K, and he can share with all of you. You can request from him. Uh, so it's a mind game, whether it is ideology, wrong teaching, wrong this, wrong that, wrong that. Okay? I hope somebody understands that. Then the other thing the enemy does, okay, I need you to understand this. Uh, like I said, this is a teaching session, uh, is a demon can either possess or oppress. Let me repeat that. A demon, demon can either possess a human or can oppress a human. Those are two distinct things. So possession, which is kind of common in, in Africa in terms of the, the, the doctrine and theology, is when a demon takes over the body of somebody. We see that in scripture a lot. Um, we, we, we see that with, uh, Judas, Satan personally took over the body of Judas. We see it in, um, in, in the person that Jesus healed, uh, when, when Jesus said, who are you? And he said, we are, there, there are many of us, legion. We see that oppression on the other hand is when you feel heavy, a burden depression or burden on you. You see that with Apostle Paul. You see that with Joshua. You see that with Elijah. You see that with a lot of people. So there is a theology that Christians cannot be possessed. They can be oppressed. I repeat, there is the theology that a Christian can only be oppressed but not possessed. That if you are possessed, that, that it might, might be because you are not, you don't have the indwelling of the spirit. Now, the reason people say that, uh, people, you know, in doctrine, some people are of the school of thought of that is because Jesus said there cannot be two masters. That a, it, it, it's if you, if the Holy Spirit come, he will drive away the other spirit. And he, so it's, it's, there's a debate on that. Uh, 
you know, people are on two sides of that. Uh, I, I have where I am. But what I want to show you on this page is how the enemy works. He uses deceit. He uses uh, wrong doctrine. He uses all of these things. Now, then the other thing you need to know is that Satan understands the limitation of being a spirit. I repeat, Satan understands the limitation of being spirit. Therefore, Satan needs human being to further his schemes. Therefore, human beings who belong to the kingdom of darkness are either possessed or oppressed by Satan to create ideology of, 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 of uh, that is against God's ideology. Let me give you an example. So uh, for many times, those of you who are students of history, you will know that um, uh, Christianity was the only religion for a very, very long time. Uh, there was the schism, why the Catholic, uh, you know, 325 AD with uh, uh, Constantine, then 1054, the great schism with the East and the West broke away. And then uh, eventually in 1517, with um with the uh, uh, uh reformation a uh, protestant reformation uh my dear brother and sister uh where they live in germany is actually the city around the city where martin luther uh, i have been blessed courtesy of them to visit and see the tomb of martin luther that led to what is called the protestant Re uh, reformation that brought about all the cur current denomination that we have today so it is important for us to understand. And before that, there's in the world, after Christianity came something called the Enlightenment. After Enlightenment came something called postmodernism. Basically, Enlightenment says, don't look at faith, look at logic. Postmodernism says, every truth is relative. I believe all those ideology come from Satan. So that to counter what God tells us to do, Basically, that is what it is. So basically, there's so many things out there. Some of you are familiar with what is called worldview. Worldview. Worldview is what people believe, where they come from, why they are here, and where they're going. And there are five big worldviews in the world. Atheism, deism, pantheism, polytheism, and monotheism. Okay? And all these worldviews, they are different from what the Bible says. Even in monotheism, which is Christianity, there are multiple uh, uh, worldviews. So it is important for you as a Christian to know what you believe, to know the truth, not just what somebody says, not what your favorite pastor say, not what I say, but you studying scripture yourself. So it's important that you understand that. So now, how does this affect marriage or family or any one of us so number one remember satan is spirit so he attacks your mind directly through the spirit also he uses other human beings uh who share his ideology who share his lies his deceit and everything and then uh they attack your mind the human being can attack you physically but basically the big methodology is through the mind so number one, ignorance of God's word is very big. This is my biggest problem that many of us who profess Jesus Christ today, we are ignorant of scripture. I used in Christianity. I was born inside a church. I grew up in church. I rededicated my life to Christ. But it is not until the last 10 years or so that I started to understand the Bible uh, differently than what somebody has taught me and I quoted. So there is a lot of lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, especially of Bible contextually. And the devil takes advantage of that. Number two, there, there are wrong teachings, even in Christianity, wrong teachings. Um there is a guy that somebody follows, and I don't want to mention name. I try really not to mention names. Uh, there's a guy, you know, people watch his YouTube a lot. But this guy, 
many people don't know that is a universalist. Okay, who is a universalist? A universalist is somebody who believes that there are many ways to God. And that is something many people believe today. There are many ways to God. Meanwhile, Jesus said very clearly, I am not condemning somebody who is not a Christian. All I know is what the Bible says. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am life. No one goes to the Father except by me. I believe that. And I don't believe the Bible just because I believe the Bible. I have done my own due diligence and I am I believe the Bible with all of my heart. So uh, it, what somebody else don't know, I can't help them. I just know what I believe. Number, number three, the society, we live in a society today called postmodernism, or some people will call it post-God. Basically, what postmodernism is, is a mixture of pantheism or what is called New Age and Christianity. So a lot of people who call themselves Christian, so we tolerate religion, but we have mixed religion with a lot of uh, things. Let me give you an example. In the Bible, God talks about perfect will, Romans 12, 2, and he talks about permissive will, Matthew 19, verse 8. So there is a perfect will of God and there are permissive will of God because of his grace. But we live in a society now where there is a lot of permissive will. So people basically, instead of striving to live in God's perfect will, they live, they say, oh, God will forgive me. Grace, grace. And they, they, they live in permissive will, which Paul said, do we continue in sin so that grace yet abound? And Paul said, God forbid. Then we have lack of wisdom. Okay. Wisdom is different from information and knowledge. Let me repeat that. Wisdom, there's something called information. There is um, uh, uh, knowledge, there is experience, and there is wisdom. So what is the difference? I am giving you information now. I am giving you information. I am giving you knowledge. Knowledge can be bad. Knowledge can be good. Information can be bad. Information can be good. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Let me repeat that. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. That is why Solomon said many times, get information, but most of all, get wisdom. Wisdom is what is knowing how to apply. God said I should give. That is knowledge. Giving and being consistent with it is wisdom. God said, uh, uh, this is what I should do in my marriage. That is knowledge. Husband, love your wife. Wife, honor your husband. That is knowledge. That is information. Doing it makes you wise. So there are people who don't have a lot of knowledge, but they are wise because they are able to apply. But what we have today in our generation, I am sorry to say, is that we have a lot of information. We have a lot of knowledge, but we have a lot of stupid people. And by the way, stupid is the opposite of, of wisdom or the Bible you call it fool. So if we, we, the wisdom is thoroughly lacking in our generation. And obviously, accountability. One of the things the enemy focuses on in our life is our mind, like I said. And if you hang out around people whose mindset is not on God, you will be influenced to that area. If you hang around people who are of God, you will be influenced in that area. I hope somebody's understanding what I'm saying. That is why the Bible repeatedly, Jeremiah, uh, Solomon repeatedly say, look, Jeremiah 6, 16, he said, he said, when you find yourself at crossroads, go to elders, go to the elders and say, when you were at this crossroad, how did you, where did you go? And Jeremiah said, if you, if you follow the advice, these are godly elders. If you follow the advice, it will be well with you. That is what Jeremiah said. Uh, 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 Solomon said, in a, in a multitude of counsel, a plan succeed. So basically, knowing the attack of, of, of the enemy on our mind, we also know how to counter it. Number one, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. 
I don't know if I have time. I, I didn't plan this, but I'm going to do it now. So this is uh, so this is a brain that I have. This is a brain, human brain, uh, that I is a model. It's not a, a real human being. Um, information that comes into us. I'm talking about the mind now. Comes into this frontal lobe. This place is called frontal lobe. And when information comes there, it is taken by what is called uh, neurotransmitters or neurons, and it is deposited in. Okay, right here, this little organ here, uh, this here. The, the small one above is called amygdala. The big one at the bottom that looks like worm is called hippocampus. That is where we store information. In Romans 12, 2, Paul said, when you become born again, renew your mind, all the things you have stored here, renew it with the word of God. So knowing that the enemy attacks your mind, you have to be in constant renewal of your word. That is why daily uh, devotion is important. That is why Bible study is important. So that on a daily basis, you are countering your sin nature with the word of God. So your mind is being renewed. You are transformed into the image of Christ by the renewing of your mind. Number two, you hang around people, you surround yourself with people who are able to hold you accountable for the things of God, for the things of God. So again, understand the battle really is in the mind. Now, how do you resist the enemy? Obviously, you have to be born again, because if you are not born again, then you cannot resist. There's nothing to resist if you are not born again. Uh, born again, this is what born again means. Very simple. It is not nothing, uh, whatever. It is powerful, but it is a simple process. God's spirit, once you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, is Jesus is uh, both your savior and your Lord. Those two things are different. Savior is the Greek word sozo. Uh, Lord is the word Adonai. So, Sozo means he has saved you. He has rescued you, both from physical illness or your soul and your spirit. That is what savior means. He saves you from. And Adonai means he is now your master. He is now the one who leads and you follow. Once that happened, the God spirit, bear witness with your spirit and that you are now the child of God. And then you get what Paul calls the imputed righteousness of Christ. You didn't work for it. God gave it to you because you are now his. Number two, transformation of the mind, transformation and protection. I just explained to you using my model. Uh, you, Whatever you have been taught from when you are young, you start to study Bible, good Bible study, and you start to transform your mind, and also to protect your mind. You protect your mind. One of the things you need to understand, and when it comes to spiritual, I'll come to spiritual warfare, is that you have to understand that the enemy knows his limitations. Okay, I want you all to understand that. The enemy does not live on a hill in your village. The enemy uh, more than likely does not live in your house. Let me tell you what goes around. Demons... Every one of us have them around us. Don't be afraid, okay? The job of the demon, who is spirit, is to constantly speak to your mind. When something is happening to you, the demon will start to tell you, give you imaginations that is not of God. That is why Paul said, when you are having that, you cannot do anything about that. But Paul said to cast down imaginations, so once you are having imagination, oh man, I'm going to fail because my mother failed, because my grandmother failed. No, Paul said, those are just lies that the enemy is speaking to your mind. Paul says to cast it down by the word of God. Well, this is going to happen to me because it happened to my mother. In Jesus' name, it's not going to happen. I'm going to live a different life. So basically, lies of the devil in our mind 
lies of uh, uh, and by the way the devil tells lies that is why jesus said the language of the kingdom of darkness is lies but i also want you to know that the lie of the devil are always not big fat lies okay they are half truths i want you to know that if the devil is going to lie to you the devil will not come to you and say this red cup is black because that will be clear he will tell you that this cup is another color. So I shine light on it. Some of you see red and some of you see white. That is what the devil does. The devil basically uses your sin nature, uses societal norm to say, oh, this is now okay. Churches have accepted it. Everybody has accepted it. Therefore, you accept it. No, you, if you are convinced, you don't have to accept it. Now, finally, spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. So what is spiritual warfare? A lot of people think that when they are clapping and yelling at church, that is spiritual warfare. Uh, nah. So let me explain it to you. So demons and Satan are spirit beings. 100% spirit being. And for whatever reason, God still allows some of them to roam the world. Okay? Now, let me describe the world to you. There are three, the Bible talks of three heavenlies. Three heavenlies. The third heaven, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, I believe, where Paul said, I know a man, whether it's in the third heaven or not. So we know there is a third heaven, and we know that third heaven is the abode of God. We also see it in Job chapter 1, where Job went to the third heaven. The first heaven is where we live. That is also scriptural. The second heaven, the Bible never really mentioned it, but we see it in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 10, verse 2. When um, Daniel was praying and God sent an angel to give uh, Daniel the answer, and that angel was hindered in the second heaven by a, a, a higher demonic angel, and it took Michael to come and release that angel. Go and read it in Daniel chapter nine, uh, Daniel chapter 10, sorry. So we know there's a third heaven, the abode of God. We know there's a second heaven, and we know there's a fourth heaven, which is where we are, human being, the human galaxy. So at the end of the time, all those three will come together in New Jerusalem. That is part of eschatology. We also know that spirit beings, demons, once they were kicked out of the third heaven, they are not allowed to go back. So they function between the second heaven and the first heaven. And some of them, like the Bible says, they are under lock and key. But Satan, for whatever reason, God allows Satan to come to the third heaven. Why? I don't know. I don't have an answer for you, but we know that. Uh, so this is what happens. Spiritual warfare is... When the demons now start to do what they do, which I've taken time to explain today, and, the, and you have the spirit of God to counter their activity, particularly in your mind. It is particularly in your mind. So that is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is having the strength to resist, is having the faith in God, not in things, in God to resist, is having the hope, is having the hope that Daniel, uh, that Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego had in Daniel chapter 3, 16 to 18, when they said, we know our God is able to save us, but even if it does not, because the biggest warfare tool of the enemy is fear, fear, fear that you're going to die, fear that something is going to happen to you, fear that if you don't compromise, this is going to happen. So fear, pride, I mean, again, he uses all these things. So that is where the spiritual warfare really, really is, is in resisting the schemes, lies, pride, whatever that is, in your mind. That is the biggest. And the way you do it is with the word of God, when you are constantly renewed in the word of God. Prayer is very powerful, but prayer is your communication with God. I want you to understand that. It's you and God talking. There are, supp there, are, uh, uh, there are supplication prayer where you ask him for things, but 
the majority of your prayer should be you and God communicating every minute, every time, every five minutes. God, how are you today? I want to tell you a secret. There's nothing you're going through that God does not know. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. Jesus said, whatever, before you ask, my father already knows what you want. I am a father of three children, adult children, and I can tell you that when they were young, I know everything they need before they ask me. I know when they needed a new sneakers. I know when they needed a new backpack. I know when they needed new whatever. So it, it is important that we know that. So the spiritual warfare, yes, we should pray. Yes, we should have time. Yes, we should fast uh, as led. But the biggest warfare is in our mind, us renewing our mind, us knowing the schemes of the enemy, and us being able to resist it, whether that be in our finances, whether that be in our marriage, whether that be in our parenting, because what the enemy will do is to bombard you. The enemy will bombard you, and you just have to stand. You have to stand. Each time, you can go on the offensive by being saturated with the word of God, by having constant communion with God. That is how, and being obedient to his word. Being obedient, Obe obeying God and doing what God wants does not mean you're not going to have struggles in life. It means when trouble in life come, you are assured. You know that your Redeemer lives. You know that greater is he that is in you. And God has given us two things against the enemy. Two things. Well, maybe more than even two, but two is very important. Number one, the name of Jesus. On the cross, God gave us a name that is above all names, above all names. Now, and then we have the blood of Jesus, which is on that side. And then God has given us the Holy Spirit to live in us. The blood and the name of Jesus against every and any scheme. And also God's Holy Spirit. And I hope some of, some of you understand that you have God living in you through the Holy Spirit. So when you have those two things, you do not have to worry about the enemy. How do I know? Because David, David went through a lot. And this is what David said. David said, when a man's way pleases the Lord, when you do things that is pleasing to God in your life, regardless of the circumstances, he said, even your enemy will be at peace with you. When David wrote that, David was staying in the house of the king of Philistines. For those of you who don't know Bible, David killed Goliath. Goliath is a Philistine. It's a Philistine. When, about a couple of years later, Saul was going after the life of, of, uh, of, of David, and David ran away, and it was the king of Philistine, the same king who David killed uh, Goliath, the same king housed David in his palace and had favor with, uh, and David had favor with him. That's when David said, when a man's way is pleasing to the Lord, it's not about the enemy. It's absolutely not about the enemy. It's about that person's relationship with God. Doesn't mean you will not go into trouble, but that trouble will not overcome you. You will pass through. Spiritual warfare. Satan has hierarchy. There are principalities, there are rulers of darkness, there are, those are just hierarchy, just like in Christianity, uh, uh, there are uh, also hierarchy of positions, admin or whatever. So don't be afraid of principalities and powers and all these demons or whatever. Make sure your way is pleasing to God. Then even the enemy will be at peace with you. So, uh, I know many of you, I don't know how many, uh, I think I'm close to one hour or 40 something minutes. I will let uh, you ask questions now. So, uh, Kay, over to you. I thank you so much, Bafemi. I, I have a lot written down. I've learned a lot and... Uh, um, I would appreciate um, feedbacks from us. This is the best time we learn. 
and um, sometimes having a dialogue like this um, brings about a lot of clarity and we'll learn more. Um, so please, if you have a question, raise your hand as I attempt to ask a few ones that I have written down. Um, the first question I wrote down is, um, what form does forgiveness take in respect to an unrepentant um, friend or relative? What form should forgiveness take, you know? For instance, if I have a friend or a colleague that is not repentant and keeps, you know, offending me on a steady basis, the Bible tells me to forgive. So what, how do I go about that forgiveness? You know, you understand, especially that the he doesn't see his wrongdoing and his, um, the tendency is there for, The tendency is there for the person to continue to, you know, to hurt me or to offend me, you know. How do we go about that one? That's the first one I okay. have down. Okay, yeah, Wait let's answer the first one. I'm, yeah. I'm there in age, I don't remember too much if you bother me. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's explain that. So the context of Second Corinthians is actually the context of forgiveness. Okay. Okay. Paul used the word schemes of the devil directly linked to talking about forgiveness. Okay. So, first of all, everybody should know that forgiveness is a command, okay? It's not a choice. Mm -hmm. That's number one. It, it's a command. Uh, you don't tell God, what about this? It's a command. That's number one. Number two, forgiveness takes time, okay? Forgiveness takes time, especially because of emotion. When you mix emotion, so you make up your mind to forgive somebody. It takes time in your, in your soul uh, to work it out. When you see that person and you are not mad. So it takes time. Don't, don't, don't sweat. Just pray. Number three, forgiveness is not for that person. The Bible is very clear. You are not, forgive, you are not being told to forgive because of that you. person. You are, God is telling you to forgive because of you. Because of you. What do I mean by that? When you don't forgive, it's like, like Paul just told us, it's one of the biggest schemes of the devil. When you don't forgive, it affects you spiritually. Spiritually, what do I mean by that? Two times in the Bible, in Malachi chapter 2, verse 13, in 1, Corinthians, in 1 Peter 3, God specifically say, if you don't forgive, I will not answer your prayer in context of marriage. It says, husband, if you don't treat your spouse well, if you don't forgive, I will not answer your prayer. So unforgiveness hinder you from God. Jesus actually spoke a lot about that. Jesus told parables about that. The, remember the parable of the servant who his master forgave and then he didn't forgive. So that's number one. It affects your communication your prayer with God. So if you have somebody you are not forgiving and you are going to do seven day, 21 day prayer, you are wasting your time. Mm. It's better you forgive than spend 40 days of prayer and fasting. So that's number one. It affects you spiritually. Number two, it affects you emotionally. Let me explain that. I told you about hormone before. When you are unforgiving to somebody, whenever you see that person, you are angry, and your body releases hormone. There are two hormones your body releases. It's called epinephrine and no epinephrine. Those hormones, they are supposed to be released at certain time because they give you strength. And they are called fight or flight. That's their street name. They give you strength, but if, you, if they are releasing your body too many times, too much time, they also cause problems. They stiffen your muscles, so they dry out your muscles. They they create then they create physical problem. Is somebody understanding this? Mm. It doesn't mean every arthritis is from is from unforgiveness. 
but it is known to cause uh, uh, it is known to cause that because of the dryness of the joints. It is known to cause a lot of things. Uh, also, doctors will tell you it is not the only reason for those things. Please don't understand me. Don't misunderstand me that if you have those things I'm mentioning, that means you are unforgiving. No, no. What I'm saying is that they can cause those things. So Satan understands that with unforgiveness, he can get you in all level of your of your being. He can get you okay. spiritually. He can get you emotionally and he will get you physically so you are not forgiving for that that's why people say unforgiveness is like drinking poison and wanting the other person to die that's why people <laughs> say that yeah. so i hope you understand that somebody it is not the person you forgive let god judge them okay let god judge that person you forgive and you be nice to them as best as you can and let god judge okay Thank you. So somebody is writing here, what's the difference between Hades and hell? And uh -huh. where, where does a, I think a sinner goes when he dies? I guess that's what he wants to write. Okay. Because you said hell has not been created. I think yes, that's the it has background not been created. of it. So I am going to, uh, I'm trying to see where I can share. Uh, it's not on my, so uh uh forgive me i am uh, i'm trying to see if i can share so in the bible the bible talks about hades uh, when you see the bible okay uh, i'm going to share something okay so the let, let me use this i hope some some of you can see this yeah can you see this yeah okay let me expand it so when Christ, there are different explanations or different diagram. People have different diagram for this. Hades has four compartments. Hades has four compartments. Um, the bosom of Abraham, like you see here, uh, Tartarus, and four compartments. I'm not an expert in this, but I know enough about this. I'm just for that person that explains it. So when Jesus came, everybody that died, in, before Jesus, they did not go to the third heaven. They went to a compartment of Hades called the bosom of Abraham. The bosom of Abraham. The story that Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man is takes place in the compartment of Hades, so that people in Tartarus can see uh, can see the people in paradise. That is where that story came from. So when Jesus came, Jesus went to the cross. He died. He, Jesus emptied out the Abraham's bosom. That is where it is said that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He took everybody in bosom of Abraham and took them to heaven. So after Jesus' resurrection, those of us who died after, we now go to the third heaven directly. But the dead, those who are not good, they still go to Tartarus, a compartment of Hades. At record, at at um, at um, second coming, millennium, after all of that thing that I said, the three heavens will come together, and hell, hell will uh, 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 will will be had, and then. Uh, Tartarus people will be sent to hell, and then the rest of us will be in the new Jerusalem. So I will encourage that person to go do your own study. <laughs> I, I have given you, I have given you a, a, a roadmap. So don't take everything I just said. Just Google it. I'm showing you Google uh, uh, so that you can study, and then ask people who you know are experts in eschatology. Okay, I think um, if I can contribute, I think the the basic thing is if a sinner dies, that person's opportunity to be restored with God is over. Yes. Because after the grave, after death, there is no more opportunity of restoration. Right now, as long as one is still alive, 
that person can repent and place his faith in Jesus Christ. But after the person dies, after a sinner dies that has not repented, the judgment of God is sure on such a person. God's punishment is sure on such a person. That's just the foundation of it. And, um, you know, you have you have laid a process that takes place. But, I mean, more or less, the, the judgment is already carried out. You yes. know? Can I say but, something to what you're saying? Yeah, okay. please. Whatever, going to heaven or hell is a decision that is made here on earth. Yeah. Okay. I hope Absolutely. everybody knows that. Whether Absolutely. it's Tartarus or hell, whether it is compartment of Hades or hell, mm. And there are two Greek words, by the way. The, the, the Greek word for Hades is what we translate as hell, but hell has a different Greek, Greek name. So whatever it is, that decision is made here on earth. Here yeah. on earth. So once you die, yeah. or whether the trumpet sound, that is, that is either the case. But I also want those of you who are Bible students, I also want you to remember that Martin Luther Martin Luther, who did the Reformation in 1517, one of the, the reason, actually, the particular reason he revolted against the Catholic Church was because of the doctrine of indulgence. Doctrine, some of you, maybe you have heard of the name or not. I want you to write it down and do your study. It's called the doctrine of indulgence. At that time, the Catholic Church was building the basilica that is in Rome today and in the 1500s, and they want to raise money. So they were raising money by telling people, if you give us money, we will pray your family out of, out of hell. this compartment of Hades into Abraham's bosom. They know it was, it was not possible, but they just want to raise money. And that They're is why, yes, that is why Martin Luther King said, I am done. And he wrote his 95 thesis. So I hope you learn a little history with that. Okay, thank you. So I does anybody have a question? I have a lot. If you leave me to it, I'll be asking. Please, if you have a question and you are not willing to, to ask it, you can please just type it in. So the next question I have is, um, Sin nature, you mentioned sin and sin nature are different. I completely agree. But um, first of all, can you explain to us, the Bible tells us that um, we are saved by grace through faith. And yes. um, the place of works is obviously at the end chain. I have to yes. be saved first by grace yes. through repentance and faith in Christ. And yes. then at the end of the chain, I have to be bringing forth good works. But my yes. sinful nature is still there. Yes. And um, how, how can one um, ensure that this sinful nature does not attempt to undo all that the grace of God is doing in a very short... Um... Okay. Thank you very much. I am going to... I've been looking through my scripture to to bring this out, but I'm going to share again so that you guys can, I, I'll show you how to, how to basically study the Bible. So we are, we're going to do sin nature. Uh, uh, actually, let me do uh, that to sin verse. Uh, and you will see, okay, it's in Romans 6, I believe. Uh, Okay, where Paul talks about, about uh, this. Uh, I don't know if I should read the whole thing. Uh, okay, let, let me just start. It might take from, time. <clears throat> yeah, okay. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin. Okay, count yourself. I'm starting from verse 11. You are mm. dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so you obey its desire. Do not offer any part of yourself as to sin as an instrument of righteousness, but rather offer yourself as those who have been brought from death to life uh, and offer every part of yourself as an instrument of righteousness. For no sin shall longer be your master. 
Okay, that is, you are no longer under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that you offer yourself to someone as obedient slave? You are slaves of the one you obey, whether to whether slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, uh, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey your heart, part, the pattern of teaching, and has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. This is this is part of what I want to show you, but it is not the, the main one. The main one. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do because I'm speaking. It looks like I'm jumping all over the place, but I want you guys to read verses three, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. Okay. So this is what so this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying. And, and I just did a full story on this. We have sin nature is what is called Abrahamic sin, the original sin. Mm. Okay, I hope somebody is understanding me. Yeah. The original sin is Abraham fall. And because of the fall of Abraham, we all inherit a sinful nature. Adam, you mean? Adam. Adamic nature, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it Adamic nature. But it is sin nature. The Bible calls it sin nature. So if you Google sin nature, you'll see what I'm saying. Now, with Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, Jesus now gives us power through the cross to, to die to sin. What that means is even though we now have the flesh that wants to do something, we now have the power because of the righteousness of Christ in us to say no. That is why chapter six says you are now dead to sin. I hope somebody understands what I'm saying. Yeah, sin absolutely. nature, Jesus did not have a sin nature. Okay, Jesus does not have a sin nature. Anybody wants to guess why? Because he was not born of a man. There was no spam. It was just egg. So anybody born with a spam and an egg has a sin nature. And because of that, you are no longer... Uh, uh, that now obedience. Paul says something about obedience that is very important, and many people mis misinterpret this and they, they misquote Hebrews eleven. What Paul said is this: faith, is faith in God is what makes you obey, and that obedience was counted as righteousness for those in the Old Testament. I'm mm. going to repeat that. Obedience comes not just because you want to obey by your own power, but because of your faith in God. I believe in God, therefore, I believe this, I'm going to do this. Mm. That is what leads to righteousness. For those of us in the in, in New Testament, we have faith in Jesus. We get his imputed righteousness, imputed righteousness, write down that word, mm. imputed righteousness, and then the Holy Spirit in us help us work it out. In theology, that is called pursued righteousness. In layman's time, it is called working out what God has deposited in you. you. So mm -hmm. It is not your effort. It is your surrender that works out righteousness in you. Okay. That works out good works in you. That is why Jesus in John 15... John 15, you guys write it down and go and read it. John 15, verses 1 to 8. Jesus said, you are the branches. I am the vine. My father is the gardener. Your job as a branch, verses 4 and 5, is to abide. It is when you abide that you produce fruit of righteousness. When you abide, when you don't abide, you don't produce fruit of righteousness because you are producing fruit according to your own strength. But when you abide, you produce fruit that brings glory to God, verse 8. So I, I hope somebody explains that, understands that. Okay, thank you. Let me, let me just add to what you have said. This abiding also demands that we renew our mind, like you have mentioned, oh, yeah. according to Romans 12.2. You know, we have the, we have, like somebody said, God has made us new. 
we are new creation in Christ. He did not add something to us. We are completely new in Christ. Whoever is in Christ is a new creature. But this new person has sinful nature in him. And we overcome that by one understanding God has made us righteous. He has called us righteous. Even though we still have this sinful nature, God says we are righteous. He sees us in Christ. And by so doing, he expects us as righteous saints to renew our mind, get God's word in our mind, you know, fellowship with him by the help of the Holy Spirit, prayer, praises, and so on, so that we'll be able, through the renewal of the mind, I know what God expects me to do. Through the prayer and praises and fellowship, the Holy Spirit is within me, giving me the ability. And with these two things, I'm able to do what God expects me to do, which is the work of obedience, which is actually working with God. And this is how we overcome the manipulation of the enemy, which brings us to the final point or the final question. We can only overcome the wiles and manipulation of the enemy when we are walking in the spirit, when we are aware. Um, all Brafemi has said, which is for us to obey him, you know, renew our mind and use the word of God, you know, and where God has placed us is for us to walk in the spirit. Because there are times that the flesh takes so much of us. Like he used the analogy, there are demons assigned to us and they just keep bombarding our mind. They keep bombarding our mind. And a lot of times we simply cannot break away from these demonic thoughts. But the word of God is supposed to be there for us to be able to break away from those demonic thoughts. Another way to express this bombardment is temptation. Just as our master Jesus was tempted, we too will always be tempted. I want to give us an illustration as we, as a way to understand it. There is tension in every marriage. And instead of both parties sitting down to actually discuss the issue, try to doubt the tension, try to, you know, find a common ground and things like that. They use their personal opinion and personal expectation to begin to dissect their issues. And unfortunately, they have two different opinions and they, they, they become competitive. They are on two sides of the issue and they are contending against each other. And you know, and it's very easy for the enemy to turn people against themselves especially when Christians abandon God's word and God's standard. And the best way by which we can, you know, ensure that the strategies of the enemy don't work against us is when we ensure that God's word and God's standard is before our eyes and we are obeying it, we are following it. You know, I remember you mentioned you mentioned that man has soul, mind, and will. Man, man has a soul, which is mind, will, and emotion. Yeah. And yeah, that is exactly the battle place in our mind. And the will is simply that which decides and pushes the whole person forward. If the mind is renewed, it is easy for the will to be carried along. It is easy. You know, so this is where the main issue is. The word of God has to be clear to us. And like he mentioned, we have to know the truth of the word of God. We have to ensure we are not ignorant and we have to ensure we are not we are not being indoctrinated wrongly. We are not being taught the wrong teaching. 
you know, so that the third one, we are able to carry out the instruction, the things that are expected of us through okay. the help of God. And by so doing, we will definitely... So, so okay, can I show you. something? Yeah, please. Uh, guys, as Kay was speaking, I put something on I'm going to show you. Okay. Can, can everybody see this? Yeah. This... Uh, Okay, everybody can see it? Yeah. Okay, so this is what Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians 5. We have a body, which is where we dwell, our senses, our action, our speech. We have a soul, which is really who we are. Uh, our body is not really who we are. Uh, uh, and our soul has the mind, the thinker, our emotion, and it has the will. And then we have a spirit. The spirit is really our identity. So don't identify yourself on anything external. When you become born again, God's spirit connect with your spirit, connect straight with your spirit. That is what born again means. It reactivates your spirit. Your spirit man is reactivated and it comes alive. That is what is called born again. That is what is called rebirth. The spirit died in the garden because of our sin nature. Now, the soul, this is where the enemy fights the battle. He fights the battle in your mind. I want you, all of you listening to me today, to please understand this. I'm sure you've heard it a hundred times from other pastors or other teachers. Your mind is the, the constant bombardment, the constant uh, half-truth, the constant, uh, if it is me, I will not agree. What about you? I mean, the devil will work with you your logical mind to prove God wrong to you. That is the battle constantly, whether directly or through other human being. The will, this is this thing calls it the chooser, is where your, 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 you choose to do or not do. Jesus chose to do in his will. He said, not my will, but your will. Paul said, God, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. And your emotion is basically reacting. So I, I hope I, I, I hope this explains it. I, I hope you guys have a, uh, somebody said I can't see it again. Mm -hmm. I hope you can. Uh, if, if you have problem, please let me know. I, I will show it again. But that is, that is basically your nature and the attack. The spiritual warfare is really in your soul. Yeah. Really in your soul. But I want you to know that you have everything needed to come against it. You have everything needed in your mind, renewal, through the Holy Spirit and the word of God. But I also want you to know that everything of God, everything spiritual is like swimming against the tide. Your flesh does not always want to do the things of the spirit, like forgiveness, like not being fearful, like having hope in times of trouble. Your flesh does not want to do that at all. So it takes constant surrender to the Holy Spirit uh, 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 and constant being around people who will encourage you to really, really die and, and fight against that powerful sin nature. Thank you. Um, but I think, I think also it is the... The, the wrong doctrine that you mentioned can actually have a great effect on these issues because someone will possibly not have heard this teaching at all and might not see the necessity of actually prioritizing these things, you know. Possibly the person is um, being taught by someone that is more or less a motivational speaker and not a Bible teacher. You know, or the emphasis of the preacher is to preach prosperity. Like some say, some believe some ministers are called to preach prosperity. Some are called to preach divine healing and so on and so forth. I think that could also contribute to one not seeing this thing as, an, as a very vital thing. What do you think about that? The, this is what I will say. Uh, to that. Obviously, we all agree that it's a 
is a process of the mind. Yeah. And lies of the devil and doctrine and things like that. One of the things that is very common, by God's grace, those of you who don't know me, I, I travel a lot. I have seen a lot in multiple countries, probably 60 plus countries. And, um, and one of the things that I see is that sometimes people teach what they know. They teach what they know. So if you ask people, why do you believe the Bible? Many people cannot tell you. They can only say what they had somebody say. So it's, that's why I tell people, you yourself have to come to the point where you know why you believe the Bible. That's number one. Let's take the issue of fear. I, I talk to a lot of people on their marriage. Many people eventually, people who divorce, who are Christians, I'm not talking religious people, I'm talking people who know Jesus Christ personally. Many of them that I have interacted with that eventually divorce, two things is what happened. Fear and pride. Fear and pride. Those is one of those two that causes the divorce eventually. So what happens is that we have a lot of wrong teaching. Wrong teaching. So if somebody teaches you that the scheme of the devil or this whatever of the devil is that you have to pray 21 day prayer and fasting. I have no problem with 21 day prayer and fast. I pray and fast myself. But that is part of warfare. That is not warfare. Warfare is really processing in your mindset so that you don't let the mindset or the process of the enemy stay. So you stay in the world and you are able to resist on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis. That is part of the, of, of the wrong mindset. When somebody tells you you have to come to church or it is the midnight prayer, you know, in, in Africa, we do a lot of, we pray at 3 a.m., we pray at 12 a.m., and I ask somebody, so you tell me, does God sleep at 3 p.m.? Can he not answer the same prayer you are praying at 12, uh, at, uh, <laughs> at, uh, at 3 o'clock? So it, it is, these are some of the wrong doctrines. Jesus, God is ready to answer you. He knows to answer you. My faith, and I will say this to you guys, my faith verse in the Bible is Daniel 3, 16 to 18. The three Hebrew children, they have gone through a lot in Babylon. This is after not eating the food uh, given to idols, but they, and, and they were going to die. They were going to die. But this is what they told Nebuchadnezzar. They said, oh king, oh king, we know our God is able to save us. We know he's able to, we know he's powerful. We have read about him. It has happened to us. We know he's able to save us, but we also know he is sovereign. We also know he is sovereign. Therefore, he, he can choose to save us, or this could be the path that we go to him. And like Paul said, whether I live or die, either is, is gain for me. Mm. Therefore, we will not bow. But some of the teachings we are getting today is, Ah, no, if you are going, if they are going to call you name, just compromise. God understands. If they are going to do this to you, compromise. Oh, please. God understands. Oh, please yes. bow so that you can continue yes. to preach to them. Yes, you, you, God will give you grace. So those are some of those teachings. And, and let me tell you, I'm a human being. I'm living in the world. I have trouble in my life every day. But the prayer I pray is God on a daily basis, on whatever basis, let me not compromise to my generation. Let me be one of the remnants that will stand, that people will know are standing for your word. I hope somebody is understanding what I'm saying. So the issue is that wrong teaching is not just terribly bad people. Wrong teaching can come from anybody. And what I found out is that once somebody compromises in one area, they start to preach grace in that area. They are not teaching you anymore to stand. So I don't want condemnation. I, we are teaching the schemes of the enemy today. So I want us to fully understand that scheme of the enemy. I, I, and I, I, I want you guys to respond to me and let me know you, you are understanding this. So please ask questions. It seems to me that only the host is asking yeah, questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, does anybody want to ask us a question? Let's it not be a two-person thing. 
Please let somebody just ask a question. I see one of my Aburo here. I don't want to call your name up. I, I, it's even surprising to me that uh, what's her name doesn't have question. Uh, Janet doesn't have question. Simi, do you have any question? Okay, why we wait? I think. Um, um, okay, very good. Thank you. Please go ahead. Please. Just thinking. Okay, talking about. So, David has a question. Okay, David. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, it's not, I guess, it's, so it's with the nature of steam, it's not really, it's kind of a question, but not necessarily a question, more like a, my thinking. The nature of steam, um, you know, we know, like you explained earlier, it's today we put our, we put our trust in, in Jesus, right? And, um, uh, is imputed. Um, righteousness, that's the word, that's the phrase that you use. Yes. Now, what about those people, um, you know, because when Paul, when Paul, um, you know, uses examples, you know, it, it, it would emphasize and say, you know, for those who are, you know, if you, 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 it says that people, that God is reaching a law in their heart, right? So by the heart, you are um, essentially, um, you will be judged by the conscience of your heart or by the laws of your heart. So for those who have not had Jesus or have not had the experience of salvation or have not been really opportune to hear the full gospel in its you know, entirety, will they be judged by the, um, because, I could imagine that some of those guys will probably, you know, maybe they believe in uh, Allah, you know, and they go five times, they pray, and they actually do ask God for forgiveness. And in their mind, they're asking the one true God for forgiveness, right? Um, yeah. Would they, how would God judge them? Okay. So, very good question. You have actually asked two questions, David. Uh, the first question you ask is, not uh, uh, God's conscience, our conscience. I want you to know, based on scripture, that in the Old Testament, the people of the Old Testament, they did not have conscience like we have it today, okay? The concept of God will put the truth in their hearts started to, was prophesied by Isaiah and subsequent prophets. The people of the Old Testament, they did not have the Holy Spirit like we have the Holy Spirit today. The Holy Spirit is the anointer. The oil is a representation. So in the Old Testament, when somebody is anointed uh, 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 with oil, it's a representation, but that person gets the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, they don't know what is good or what is bad because their heart is not wired that way. That is why when you read the, uh, the, the Old Testament, and David, you were part of it when we studied the Minor Prophet, you will see that uh, when Josiah said, oh, go and re repair the temple, and they found the, they found the Torah, and they started to read it, they said, oh, we didn't know. But those of us in the New Testament, under the, a new covenant, uh, we, whether you are a Christian or not, you have a conscience that tells you this is bad or this is not bad. I hope you understand. That is why Paul said, the law cannot save you. The law only shows you what you have done wrong. So the law is different from principle. Under the Old Testament, God dealt with the people based on obeying the law. For those of us in the New Testament, we are no longer under the law. We now have principle. We, God judges us based on principle. So what is the difference for those of you listening? A principle is that don't steal. Stealing is bad. So God is judging us based on that principle. We, now we know. A law is if you, if you steal, I will cut your hand. That's the law. The Old Testament people function on that law. They had 613 of them. We function based on principle because now we are able to recognize since Christ, every human being, good or bad. 
those of us who are Christians, we now understand, we now have the added pleasure of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So I hope I understand, I explain that. The second part of your question is, uh, what is the, you, you said something that I just forgot now. You, you, your question had two parts. Can you remind me of the second part? Um, for those, those that did not hear the gospel, how will God judge? Okay, them? good question. Those who have not heard the gospel. So I want you to know, David, that everybody, whether you hear the gospel or not, that because of your conscience and if you're seeking, God will speak to you. I can tell you, I know friends, personal friends, who nobody spoke to them. They were taught in the Quran or any other books and in studying and in trying to study the principle of Christianity, they came to Jesus. So because of the conscience, because this week I was talking to somebody, somebody was asking me questions about how to preach to a Muslim and I was helping that person understand. I said, the Holy Spirit is everywhere, o o omniscient. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. If somebody is truly asking, they will get. Obadiah in the Bible, it was not a Jew. Obadiah was actually an Edomite who heard the scripture by Elijah and converted to Judaism. When you seek the God in spirit and in truth, regardless of where you're coming from, God will meet with you. I think that is where we are, David. It is nice, those of us, that have been called to go out into the world and preach the gospel, we should do that. But we also should remember that our job is to lift Christ up, then he will draw to himself. I actually think social media is a good thing. So uh, because of time, I, I hope that answer your, your question. Uh, Brake, okay, there's a question here. Should I read it? Okay, it please says, do. My husband refused to forgive his mother because she abandoned him when he was young. Mm. Like, like we said before, I want, again, I'm going to repeat this. You are not forgiven because of your mother. You are forgiven because of you, because of what unforgiveness is doing to you. I did not speak to my own daddy for four years. Okay, my daddy is going to be 87 in couple of, in two months. And there was a period in my life that I did not speak to him. It was one year before I left Nigeria and three years after I came to America. I did not speak to him. We did not talk because I was mad at him. It was only when I had my son who is now 28 and I carried my son and I started to cry and I called him. The man didn't even know that I was mad at him. So all this why he was free, but I was the one that epinephrine and no epinephrine was destroying. I was the one whose prayer was being hindered. Hmm. So if I were talking to that husband, I would say, let your mother go. Let them go. And let me tell you what I have learned about our parents. I took the time to learn about my father. I took the time to spend time with him. Uh, as a man, I feel it could, it could be better. But I learned of his background. I learned of how he grew up. And I saw that the culture and everything really affected him. He had an opportunity to grow in Christ because he became born again, but he never grew in Christ, in my opinion. Or some of the things he learned, like Kay was saying, they were wrong doctrines, but he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to true doctrine. When I was doing YEC, he would go and pray over paper, over pen. I mean, those are the type of Christianity <laughs> that he believed. They didn't do anything. I got C6 all around. Thank God. I don't think he had anything to do with the paper because if if the, if the pen if the pen was good, maybe I should have gotten a one. Okay? <laughs> but I got C six all around because that was what I studied. So mm -hmm. I, that is I, I so forgive not because of your mother, not because of those who offend you, but for you, for your relationship with God, for your health, and for your assurance of mind. Thank you. Let me quickly say something to it. I think um, it's very easy for us to 
to stay in unforgiveness, when we don't look at things from God's perspective, if there is a weapon the devil uses against us a lot, is to stop us from looking at things from God's perspective. You know, and this person is saying, how can she abandon me as a mother? How can she do this? How can she? We have completely left God's perspective away. Because all this how can, how can God put them aside in forgiving us? The same way we too have to put it aside in, in because that is what stands against our forgiving our people that offend us because we don't see things from God's perspective. And as humans, we cannot really blame them as humans, but as Christians, God commands it of us. And um, when I came here, there was a saying that the Germans used to say, it says, um, one cannot force forgiveness. You can't force forgiveness. Um, you can't force forgiveness. It is only God that can help, but it is seen it from God's perspective. And the easier way is I've offended God, I've done more worse thing to God, and God has forgiven me. Therefore, it is my duty to forgive. And like he said, it's carrying the heart about does not change anything. I mean, you cannot re, you cannot reverse back to many, many years that the mom was not in, in your life or anything, you know? So there's really nothing one can do except to put it in God's hand and forgive by letting the hurt go away, the bitterness, let it go and things like that. I wanted to respond to David's message. Just like Brafemi, um, his question, just like Brafemi said, there are two categories of people on earth today. No matter the religion they are, religion are only very good that is conveying us to eternity. The quest for the truth is what brings a certain set of people out. Just like people that are scientists or people in ivory towers that are professors and so on, their duty is only to search for the truth and update themselves. The same way as men, when we, as the highest creation of God, are persistently on the search to know the truth about God, we will definitely find him. We will definitely find him. It is amazing that man in every area is logical and consistent, but when it comes to the things of God, man becomes completely inconsistent because he doesn't want to give glory to God. So by so doing, we cannot conclude that there are people on earth today that have not heard the gospel. Because as far back as the 80s, when I was attending Christ Chapel, Christ Chapel had churches in Asian, in these um, Arab countries. They had it in Iran, in, in I think Iraq. They had churches there, they were preaching. And there are radio stations that are preaching the gospel to the Islamic world in Arabic and so on. So number one, we cannot conclude there are people on earth today that have not heard the gospel. On the contrary, there are people that have set themselves to do everything to reject the gospel, reject the truth about God. And we can safely conclude that these people are not going to obey God anyway. Because when you do everything to please yourself, to satisfy yourself in this world, then you have kept God out. You have simply kept God completely out. Because it is obedience to God is a prerequisite to salvation. When you hear the truth and you obey it, then you become saved. So that's just it. So we can not conclude. And God, in a lot of ways, get the gospel across to people. There are so many Muslims that are Christian today that they claimed that Jesus Christ actually appeared to them in a supernatural form, maybe in form of a person or whatever. And they are Christians today. You know, so yeah. it's not it's so not really. If, if, I, if I can 
um, I completely agree with what you what you both said about um, you know about you know those who are truth seekers, those who seek God's truth will mm-hmm. find God. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but what I'm saying, my question is, for someone who has who's in their mind has sought the truth and you know, and I know there's so many people in the world now that they have, and I, I did mention about, you know, there are many places today that the, the teaching of the word of God is not crystal clear. So you will hear an instance of where a Muslim just thinks that Christians are serving four or five gods or three gods or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, they're not, they, they, they resolve from the, from the what seems to be provided them through the Quran as the one true and only God. And there is no amount of persuasion or no amount of conviction, uh, sorry, no, no amount of preaching will convince them because they've been able in the MI, in the SNK, to identify errors um, in the scripture. So they are completely and utterly um, believe they're serving the one and only true God. Mm. And it would, and, and, you know, and every other message, it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to tally because these things only come by the revelation um, of God. These understandings, this, 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 you know, of course the Holy Spirit is one. So what answer, the answer that you have not heard, if you like, is, if people are in that situation and in their heart they feel they are um, truly, you know, they've asked for God's forgiveness, same one God as a Muslim, you know, God will ask for forgiveness, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And, and I'm sure many people have died in that same situation, right? So the question is, where are they going? So, okay. David, okay. Well, uh, uh, okay, okay, let me, yeah. Please let me quickly reply. Okay. Um, David, <clears throat> do you know that there are lots of people that have studied the Quran and they've ended up being Christians? Yes, I 100%. Yeah. Good. That's why it comes back to what I've said. You see, um, the Quran does not. <laughs> The Quran is, um, how do I say this now? The Bible, the Quran describes Jesus as the Messiah. Even the prophet Muhammad is not called the Messiah. The Quran describes Jesus as the Messiah. And I tell you that um, a lot of Muslims, I can tell you this, because as a private thing, I've, I've read a lot of Quran. I'm from a Muslim background, you know. A lot of Muslims do not read the Quran because the Quran is a, a, a book that contradicts itself. It glorifies and raises Jesus Christ far above Prophet Muhammad. You understand? So, it comes back to yep. what I'm saying. We cannot completely assume that these people, yeah, of course, there are people in Islam that still believe that Islam is the way. But when they read the Quran themselves and the Quran tells them Jesus is the Messiah and the Quran tells them even the prophet Muhammad is not sure where he's going when he dies or when they read the Quran, and the Quran tells them a lot of funny things, like Surah 9, verse 5, and a few other ones that commands them to do violence against their neighbors. So, so, so the truth. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 like I said, I completely agree with what you're saying, but my question is still no answer. So, so David, Which David, is, let me answer your question. Yes. David, yes. let me answer your question. The uh, one thing we know about Bible, and this is, again, we're talking about the schemes of the devil. And one of the schemes of the devil today is to convince, for us Christians, to convince ourselves that goodness, not godliness, is the way to heaven. 
So we convince wow. ourselves that once somebody is good, a good God cannot condemn them to hell. That is part of mm. the lie of the enemy that a lot of Christians today believe, starting from mm. Carlton Pearson, starting from uh, to um, what is that guy that has a uh, very popular that has he, he calls himself a Christian, but he's a universalist. So that's number one. Number two, we believe scripture. I believe the Bible when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Mm. 